Hi everybody. Um, I think we're we're going intro-less. Um, I'm Rob Spillman. I'm the editor of Tin House. I've met uh, most of you here, and uh, this is Peter Cole, and we're going to be talking about his uh, sort of journey of translating um, translating the Middle East from his own personal poetry to translating contemporary and modern Hebrew and Arabic and medieval as well. So. Um, and we're going to just sort of go back and forth, and Peter is going to give us some uh, examples. Uh, he's going to read some work, and we're going to talk about it, and then we'll open it up to uh, some Q&A. So um, I wanted to start off with, um, you said last night that you were from suburban New Jersey, and um, I'm wondering if you would sort of expand on the idea of why you went to Jerusalem to become a poet, and uh, what, what that journey yeah. was about. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? I can't quite tell. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. So, uh, well, I was actually, I was born in Patterson, New Jersey, which is not exactly the suburbs and has an illustrious literary history, um, but we moved to the suburbs when I was about 10, um, and I did go to a few years of Jewish day school in Patterson only because my parents wanted to keep me out of the uh, public schools. Patterson was not a, uh, an easy place, and we talked about the early 60s. Um, so my reasons for going, I, but I basically grew up in an assimilated Jewish family. I mean, I had sort of classic stuff, a bar mitzvah and all that, but we're not a religious family in any way, or even identified Jewish uh, in any strong way. Um, and my name is Cole, which Peter Cole is not exactly a Jewish name. Uh, my father was Cohen, my mother was Levinson, you know, usual American story. Um, but when I was a college student, uh, I started out studying at Williams College, uh, comparative religion and philosophy. And like all young Jews, I was interested in Eastern religion and Buddhism and Hinduism and all these things. Um, but I quickly understood that I really wasn't serious about it. I didn't, how did I know I wasn't serious? I didn't want to learn those languages. I didn't want to put in all that time and effort. And I dropped out of college. And I thought, well, there's really no need to go to college after all. You know, you can read these books on your own. And a family friend convinced me to, to go back. I went to Hampshire College, it was more experimental, and I began writing poetry there. And this is now the mid-70s, 70, about 76, 77. And in the air, very much in the air, uh, in the literary air in those days, particularly for poetry, were discussions about um, American Jewish poetry. Harold Bloom in particular, but uh, Jeffrey Hartman, a lot of the people at Yale were uh, I now am and know these people, uh, but I didn't know them then except as these kind of giants who were issuing these proclamations from on high, uh, in particular about um, Jewish American poetry and why it was such a problematic thing to be a Jewish American poet, this kind of split identity. And the basic problem that they talk about mostly is that the literary tradition in America, uh, or in English, the poetic tradition is a Judeo-Christian tradition, which means it's a Christian tradition, right? That's based on Judaic sources. And of course, the history of English poetry, particularly in England, but also early America, is a Christian. I mean, if you know the history of English poetry, you have to be imbued with the, that Christian tradition. And I love that tradition. I also love the Christian tradition. But I kind of, you know, sort of penny dropped, and I realized, no, I just had a, I actually had, there was a, two specific days. It was like a vision that sounds pretentious, but it was two very specific moments. I know exactly, I could tell you exactly where I was in two places. One was in Amherst, Massachusetts, one was in Greece. And where I just understood that if I was ever going to write any good poetry in my life, it was going to come out of the Judaic side of that hyphen. And I don't know why I felt that, it was maybe totally diluted, but it, was, uh, had, it resonated with something to do with uh, 
sort of the childhood education I did have or some sort of sensibility. And, um, and so I decided that language I did want to learn. And so I basically went to, to Israel to learn Hebrew, um, like I said last night, to become an American poet. And you know, I had a lot of sort of older friends who said, so you're going to go to Israel to learn English? What's, you know, it's, uh, it didn't seem like it was going to add up. Um, but that was the basic reason was I wanted to explore the sort of the Judeo-Hebraic side of, the, of that tradition and see what there was because there was, I didn't feel that I could get it just by reading the few. There weren't a lot of translations also in those days. Um, and boy, did that ever pan out. I mean, that just turned out to be the most interesting tradition, and it's been my whole life, really. Right, and at what point did you start reading Arabic as well? Was that at the same, same time? No, or? Arabic came much, much later. Um, I don't think any of our Arabic speakers are here right now. But um, the joke about Arabic is that the first 40 years are the hardest. Uh, <laughs> it's an extremely, I learned Hebrew very quickly. Um, within two months, I was reading difficult medieval things and modern Hebrew literature. And I was uh, totally obsessed. You could be as obsessed as you want with Arabic after two months. Mm. You're, you're not going to get very far. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful language, but much more complicated. So that didn't come for another 20 years, a thir uh, 15, 20 years. After I'd been living in Jerusalem for quite a while, I came to understand that it was, uh, and I was also translating medieval Hebrew, which is very much, we don't go into all the detail, but it's very much a kind of offshoot of Arabic literature. It actually is a kind of Arabic literature, but written in Hebrew. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. I can't go on in good conscience, continue to do this stuff without learning. I was also reading a lot about Arabic in English. I thought, I've got the same thing. I've got to take the plunge. Mm -hmm. I was in my mid-30s then. Um, also, I was living in Jerusalem, surrounded by Arabic. But you know, people in Israel, Jews in Israel, you don't. There's no need to deal with Arabic. Um, you don't hear it. You don't see it. It's everywhere around you. It's on the signs. It's on the the street signs and the airport and everywhere. And if you don't know it, you just don't see it. Actually, we'll we'll talk more about that because that's politi important political ramifications. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of came to the point where I just felt like if I'm going to live here anymore, I have to. So, so back to your you know the original journey and the the sort of translating. Um, you first had to start with translating yourself, right? When you got there and discovering yourself and you know right. excavating yourself right. and was it? Did you have a, these aha moments reading translated work? Was that you know, directly influencing your own the, work? Yeah, that, that was a good question. Um, in some senses, the first thing was translating myself, but the fir in a way, the first thing I had to do, I didn't know that I was doing it, of course. This is all sort of happening. You don't know what's happening to you as a young writer or, or as a middle-aged writer. Um, I had to, in some ways, translate myself out of myself. I had this, and this is a, it turns out to be a process that many writers go through, particularly in poetry, um, I was sitting next to Erica John last night. We were talking about, uh, she said, oh, I think it's really all writers have to go abroad to become themselves. That in a certain sense, you have to leave yourself to become yourself. And so that process of being in this foreign culture and taking in this foreign language uh, helped me empty myself out in a certain sense. And so in terms of aha moments, I think the first real aha moments I had were, again, they come from unexpected places. I had an Iraqi Jewish friend who was a family friend who sort of took me under his wing and introduced me to Eastern Judaism, which is totally different. You know, most Americans, we think of like the Judaism as sort of a straight shot from the Bible to the shtetl with a stop on the Lower East Side, and then there's us. Yeah. And that wasn't Judaism. You know, in the Middle Ages, the kind of stuff I translate from and write about a lot, 96%, 90 to 96% of world Jewry lived in the East and spoke Arabic and basically were Arabs for all intents and purposes. Um, so he introduced me to that world. And at a synagogue, I used to go in these kind of gospel sessions. Uh, they would read these texts in the middle of the night. And it was reading those texts, actually, that totally kind of cracked my mind open in terms of, wow, what you could do with language that I just had no idea about. And the idea that this could even be remotely possible in English I think that's one of the first real sort of you know, conversion, uh, mm. literary conversion experiences right. I had. Um, so when did you decide that you wanted to actually translate others' work? I mean, where, you know, at this yeah. point you were 
still just concentrating on yourself and your yeah. own work? So, well, that moment of where I say, you know, the sort of my literary sensibility that I had at that point sort of cracked open by this intrusion of the foreign literature as an incorporation of the foreign, um, that produced a whole new kind of poetry in me, um, a kind of poetry that I, I didn't really under, think I you know, was capable of writing. And um, after that first year, I, sent, I had wrote a long poem, and I sent it out to conjunctions. We were just talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, literary magazine in New York, which was still pretty new and doing beautiful looking uh, issues. That was important to me, too. And they took that poem, and it won a prize. And it, so that was kind of the beginning of that. And there was translation smuggled into that work, in a way. Like I would use, it would, I like to disguise things like that. But the first real translation I did, it's even weirder. I had a, uh, became very close to an older poet um, who was an American, his name's Harold Schimmel. Probably nobody here has ever heard of him. Um, he was actually a very talented young poet in English and uh, moved to Israel in the, he's now in his mid-70s, uh, moved to Israel in the early 60s. And uh, it was a kind of a New York school poet, very much a poet of a locale. And he felt also that how can you be a New York school poet in a foreign language, in a foreign country? So he switched to writing in Hebrew. And he became an excellent, a really excellent uh, Hebrew poet. And, um, and I loved his work. We were very close, as I say. But whenever he would translate himself back into English for a lot of visiting writers are always coming through Jerusalem, his translations were terrible. They were just awful. And it was some kind of weird psychological thing. It was if he was working out some sort of deep neurosis in these terrible translations. <laughs> and I was offended on behalf of the dignity in, of my friend, who if I'm gonna tell people he's so good, that, you think that's good? <laughs> so I started to translate him, which is bizarre, right? He could translate himself. And um, did a whole manuscript of his, and, and I found out, it was another kind of aha moment, because I found out that in the process of that kind of translation, I loved being in that weird space between the languages. And you know, you get into the kind of black box of language. Um, is a, one of the great scholar of Jewish mysticism, uh, Gershom Sholem is his name, for those of you who know. And for don't, don't know, really one of the great writers, German stylists, uh, prose stylists, and scholars of the 20th century. He was, er, early in his life, he was a literary translator and um, had very interesting correspondence with Franz Rosenzweig, who translated the Bible into German. And he said something in a letter. He said, translation is one of the greatest miracles taking us into the heart of the sacred order from which it springs. Translation is one of the greatest miracles taking us into the heart of the sacred order from which it springs. Now, that's a very different way of talking about translation than most people talk about it. Usually, people talk about translation. They say, well, the problem of translation. Well, it's only a translation. What can you expect? You know, the sort of the mm. default expectations are pretty low from translation. But I experienced that miraculous sense of, wow, you are into the place where language is being generated. And not only that, you actually are now responsible for its continued growth. Uh, it's not that different in a way from what happens in original writing, mm -hmm. but you're, it's more objectified when you're dealing right. with somebody else's work. Yeah, you've said in the past that you know, care for language feels to me like a moral and also a metaphysical act. And I, I think, you know, especially for aspiring writers, I think you know, translation is a great gateway to like that, that words deeply matter and that you really have to you know, get in there and be right. almost, it's almost a sacred. There, thing. All those things are there for me, uh, particularly when we talk about the Middle East. Um, First of all, I remember meeting Galway Cannell once. I mean, most of you probably know if you're in Bala Poetry, who Galway Cannell is. And um, he did a wonderful translation of the French poet uh, Francois Villon once, uh, I think in the 70s. And so I met him when I was a student, and I was telling him how much I liked these translations. And he said, never again. <laughs> and I said, what's so why not? He says, it just takes too much goddamn time. And translate, it does. To translate really well, if you have high standards for yourself, it just takes forever because you, if you are translating someone a work that you really, really respect, it gives new meaning to the sense of doing justice to somebody's work. You, in some ways, almost more than you'll do for yourself. You just will not give up until, if you have that, feel that moral obligation, um, you will not give up until it reaches a certain kind of quality. Um, 
And it's all the more poignant when you're dealing with the Middle East, where, let's face it, you know, that this has got kind of the world by the balls, as it were, and that you have the fates of entire cultures being worked out now. You know, you have the fate of Palestinian culture for sure. You also have the fate of Jewish culture in the Middle East uh, being worked out. And these are very, very high stakes. So if you are, if you take on the translation of a, a writer who you feel is genuine and is genuinely embodying all this in whatever way he's doing it, that's a pretty large responsibility. And it, particularly with the Palestinian cause where, you know, what is the cause? It's an argument for justice being done. Mm -hmm. So now you're gonna try to do justice to justice. Um, and I guess I like that responsibility mm -hmm. too. Um, yeah. I think it's a, uh, also a way what Rita Dove talks about um, that, um, that the sort of one of the goals of literature is to go from thinking about they and them to he and she, to going from generalities of a people and you know sort of where the, the source of kind of racism and um, you know nationalism come from and actually get to the place where we're talking about individuals and that was you know, I think translation is a great way to, a great, For great way there. sure, and you know, that is, um, you know, maybe we'll look at some work in a minute, but that, uh, again, particularly when you're dealing with Palestinian writers, um, but also with, with Jewish writers, Palestinian poets, in particular, but fiction writers too, are always looked at, almost always looked at as what they represent. This one represents, you know, that political attitude, or this one represents that particular cause, and almost always lost in that approach, and I understand the approach. If I were editing something, you know, I would have that on the mind too, uh, to some extent, and sometimes do. But what's lost in that is the artfulness of an individual writer, which is why they're a writer. It's what makes them, why anybody's mm -hmm. interested in them in the first place. Mm -hmm. So as a translator, also as an editor, I work, I run a small press, um, and we publish Middle Eastern literature by and large. Um, one of the, th I think the first thing I'm really concerned with is respecting the artfulness and bringing out the artfulness of a writer, regardless of the political position that writer has. And I often, and increasingly these, these days, I like to translate writers who have political positions I find revolting. Because it makes a point. What's the point? point is that there's so much, and I, let me just put my cards on the table, I'm very far to the left in my sort of political views on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and Israeli politics. We'll read some poems, you'll, I'll prove it. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but the political correctness that surrounds the discussion of the Middle East, and particularly the Palestine-Israel conflict, is just death to art. Everybody's afraid to say what they really think. You just, you know, people just say, oh, if something, you know, uh, someone spouting or stands for the cause, the position they identify with, that's good. Okay, well maybe the, the position's good, but you really thought that was a good novel? I don't think so, you know? But nobody will say that. And, mm -hmm. and you have to have a lot of courage to say that, mm -hmm. because it will also sound like you're putting down the position. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the ways to make that point, that that's something that needs to be talked about more, is to translate, like, so for me, to translate a very right-wing writer, who's only if I think they're a great poet. And you know, so uh, there's one writer I translate, Aaron Shabtai, who was also identified as a leftist, and had, he's a—I mean, he's just like a flaming leftist. And um, but in the mid '80s, Menachem Begin was the prime minister of Israel. For those of you who remember Begin, and um, he wrote a. Then this is this is like the craziest idea for a book of poems. Nobody would you know, bring this up in a workshop. But he got into his head that the left had lost warmth. The left was all about kind of cold ideas, and they didn't understand where they were in the world, in the Middle East, for example. Um, and whereas Begin, even though he completely disagreed with his political ideas, Begin understood something basic about being human and being with other people. He drew different conclusions, but he understood something basic, and that basic thing was really important. So Shabtai came up with an idea to write a book-length poem that was an ode to Menachem Begin, in which, and it gets wilder, in which he took two pages from his autobiography, Bacon's autobiography, called Revolt. Bacon was a fascist. And, um, and then he almost randomly took one page from you know, the first part of the book, one page from the second, 
And then he did a, what's called a midrash in Jewish tradition, a rabbinic commentary on scripture, where you kind of free associate and develop kind of wild ideas about what's in the text. What's, what's the text not telling you? And so one of the things he did from this was uh, a very detailed portrait of uh, Begin's wife breastfeeding with her first child. It's like the most detailed you know, description of breastfeeding you'll ever read. Uh, except in a textbook, probably. And, uh, and the other half was the Jewish right-wing underground breaking into the British munitions depot to steal uh, guns, basically, to commit Jewish terrorism. And he turned this into a book of poems, and a wild book of poems. I like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so. Well, I know in the introduction to, um, to one of Shapti's books, you say that um, the poet's primary responsibility, Shapti makes clear, at least at the level of literature, is freshness, attentiveness, and surprise. And, you know, I think that's, that's one of the reasons why we read is, you know, that, that sort of, it's not just, it's language and surprise and to be taken, you know, someplace new no. and visceral and... Definitely, because if you don't have that, you don't have anything. You have to do more than just shock. Maybe yeah. I'll read a Shabtai poem or two, sure. and just, I mean, that's, we were talking yeah. about what direction we go in, and this wasn't it, but why not? Um, <laughs> I'll, re I'll read maybe two short Shabtai poems to illustrate this notion of um, uh, uh, both of freshness. Um, these, are, these are in his flaming left-wing uh, uh, period, which is more recent. Um, but he's also so somebody... the title is, too. I mean, it's, it's a great title for the book. Everyone. Well, the, the other, the book that we were talking, this was, the first book of political poems he did was called Jacques Somebody said to me, why did he give it a French title? Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, and the second one, this is a selected poem that just came out called War and Love, Love and War. It's sort of the two poles of his poetic consciousness. And um, apart from the Begin poem, Shamtai was not somebody who was a political poet before that. Uh, in fact, for the entire decade before that, he was writing basically bawdy erotic poems, also sort of shake the Israeli reading public out of its uh, sort of torpor. Um, but he has written about the way in which the political realities of Israel and Palestine just so overpowered him that at a certain point he felt he could not go on writing as a poet if he didn't address this stuff directly, even though he knew this was risking a kind of um, literary suicide. So I heard uh, on NPR listening to the radio this morning Rob's conversation with Reza Aslan and Daniel were, they broadcast a little bit of it, and I guess this came up, the question of whether or not um, introducing politics directly into literature will destroy, you know, lower the literary quality. Um, and I have to say that I don't think it, it necessarily does by any stretch of the imagination. It, you know, in the hands of a lesser writer it does. Um, but I knew uh, one Israeli poet once who I'd invited when I was teaching at Wesleyan University, came and talked to the students, and the students said to him, and this is a, a fairly well-known uh, poet in Israel, said, why do you always, why do you write about politics so much? Lebanon War, 1973, this, why do you write about politics? It's not a literary topic. And he looked at them like, and he said, it's like asking a Greek poet who lives on an island why he, why he writes about the wind. <laughs> I mean, that's what the wind is where I live, you know? Uh, and if I didn't write about it, I'd just be, I'd be wouldn't be alive. Um, so Shabtai said he was willing to risk this. So I'll give you uh, an example. First, a, a more disarming one. Um, Israel is also uh, Israel in Hebrew, I should say, and it's very much a culture of two societies, Arabic and Hebrew, and um, they don't meet very much, and um, one is clearly the dominant. Hebrew is by far the dominant culture. Um, but literary discussions uh, are conducted in Israel in a way that would boggle your mind uh, here in America. Um, the weekend paper, like the New York Times on, let's say, Sunday, the Sunday edition of the Times, so the equivalent, which comes out on Friday in Israel, and um, there are three papers like this, but the best one has tons of poems in it and translations, and sometimes three translations. Somebody published a new translation of Rambo. Okay, let's publish six translations of Rambo. They fill up a whole page. And sometimes they'll have two reviews of a new translation of Plato, of a dialogue or something. And it was, it's getting, there's not as much of that as there used to be, but it still exists. So these poems I'm going to read you now were published, basically, think of them being published, now it's Saturday, you get the New York Times book review, and you sit down at your paper, at your table, you know, uh, whatever, and you're going to read these. This is what you encounter. And so this particular poem he wrote 
before the, pres uh, the pr uh, elections for the prime ministership in Israel in 2001. And the two candidates then were uh, Ariel Sharon and uh, Ehud Barak. Most of you know enough about what's going on to know who they were. And Shabtai would fight. He was then living, uh, his wife was teaching in Amsterdam, so he was living there. And he would call me, he's a, a, a night owl, I'm not, he, but he would call me like at two in the morning and we'd have arguments while we were doing this book. Not about how to translate, but about how to vote. And the question was, and this was a kind of countrywide discussion, particularly among leftists, was, you know, Ehud Barak, everybody knew that he was bad news by then if you were, if you were in the peace camp. But Ariel Sharon, he was really bad news. I mean, he was basically a convicted war criminal, basically, by Israel's own commission after the Lebanon War. And um, so the question is, you know, do you hold your nose and vote for Ehud Barak because that's the way democracy works and you make these compromises? Or do you do the radical thing and cast a blank ballot, which of course makes it easier for Sharon to win? But it's, uh, it's, kind of, it's actually a difficult decision. You know, these are, and this, Israel's a country where a lot, most people vote. It's, you know, 80, 85% in those days would vote. So it was a real big issue, and Shabtai had the more radical position, cast a blank ballot, I was the good liberal. No, 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 hold your nose and vote for Barack. So, little did I know what was coming. In the paper, two or three days before the elections, Shabtai had this poem. So imagine, the New York Times, this is the most respectable paper, the paper of record in Israel, and the, um, the poem was called uh, Elections, so in English I give you the title, Elections Israel 2001, just to orient the reader. I'm for Pipi, long live Pipi. Pipi's mission is civilized, cultured, salubrious. Pipi makes sure the blood flows smoothly, cleanly, and for a good reason. Therefore, thanks to Pipi, words give off a pleasant scent. Not for nothing do the leading writers and professors express their support for Pipi. I'm for Kaka. Kaka resembles earth that swallows the choice words stuck to the brow of every terminated target. Kaka does what Pipi does, but with greater boldness, without hiding behind professors. The truth, in fact, stinks, but it's beautiful in its solid state. Therefore, I'm for Kaka. Long live Kaka. <laughs> okay, so you get a sense of, uh, yeah of the tremendous sort of torque this and leverage that this imagination has right in the middle of the culture, you know, mm -hmm. um, and also calling people's bluff. Uh, read one, just one other Shabtai poem to give you sort of the more serious uh, and really profound side of this. Um, where did that go? One second. Uh, okay, so same thing, same newspaper. Same occasion, Passover. Passover in Israel is the biggest, it's like Christmas in the States. It's the one holiday everybody celebrates, everybody goes to their families, everything stops. And when everything stops and you go to your family and you have all these relatives over, you can't talk to your family over there. You have to read the paper. Basically, everybody escapes from everybody else by reading this enormous newspaper that comes out with a huge cultural supplement and everything like that. So this was the chapter I had, a Passover poem, and this was at the, um, this was the second intifada, the second Palestinian uprising, um, you know, which was extremely violent and um, painful for all involved. So the Passover story, during Passover, everybody reads the Haggadah, you tell the story. So Shabtai writes, and let me just say one other thing, that um, religious Jews have to make their homes kosher for Passover, you know that thing. So one of the ways particularly poorer families would do it is they have big cauldrons in the middle of the street in religious neighborhoods, and the way you make it yourself kosher is you bring your pots out and you dip them in the scalding water. In boiling water, you scald them, right? And it's a kind of communal way of doing it. So what he says is, instead of scalding your pots and plates, take steel wool to your hearts. You read the Haggadah like swine, which if put before a table, would forage about in the bowl for parsley and dumplings. Passover, however, is stronger than you are. Go outside and see, the slaves are rising up. A brave soul is burying its oppressor beneath the sand. Here is your cruel, stupid pharaoh dispatching his troops with their chariots of war. And here is the sea of 
freedom which swallows them. Again, this kind of just devastating reconceiving of the Passover story. Mm -hmm. so, this is somebody, obviously, for whom you know, politics needs to be in literature. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's presenting you know, a radical position, but to the general reading public in Israel, and pre presenting a position that most of the reading public would actually not really encounter, because they don't have to encounter it. They can ignore it. They can go on with their lives unless somebody like this you know, puts it in their face. And of course, you can imagine he's completely reviled uh, <laughs> in Israel. Uh, it's only the publisher of the newspaper. There was actually just a big feature in the New York Times about the publisher of this newspaper, Amos Shakan, mm -hmm. uh, stands by him and says, no, he is the prophet of our day, the literary prophet of our day. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what's striking is not just the, the visceral message, it's just the power of the words. I mean, he's it's not a simple message and he's really right. and he's you could create. write a bad poem on, with using the same yeah topics and themes absolutely right. but yeah. you're you're drawn in by the language and the force of the language right. and, and then the also freshness. as a translator that's the thing is how do you then find the way in you know what where is his artfulness and there's a lot of artfulness he himself is israel's great translator of greek drama mm -hmm. tragedy and comedy into mm -hmm. the man who knows a great deal about the power of words mm -hmm. and so i try to respect that and in a certain sense, to sort of absorb it. Right. Yeah. I think that's a, a good segue to um, how did you come to uh, medieval uh, poetry? I mean, you're, you know, uh, since the general discussion, Peter is known for his contemporary translation, but he also um, he also did this amazing book, and I really highly recommend this. It's called The Dream of the Poem. Hebrew Poetry from Muslim and Christian Spain, 950 to 1492. And uh, what's, what's remarkable me, to me about this book is the aliveness of the poetry. And it feels really fresh and, and contemporary. Yeah. Well, um, so you know, the, last night, the quote I read about the description of this sort of ethos of um, East-West hybridization uh, by Mahmoud Darwish, that's where I got the title for this book, The Dream of the Poem which also I thought I was going to get a lot of uh, flack for that. How could you give, this is like the greatest Hebrew poetry of all time, or certainly after the Bible, how can you give it a name based on something a pa the Palestinian national poet said? Not a single person got upset. Nobody wrote about that. They, you know, the book got a lot of attention, but they, that seemed somehow appropriate. Um, so how did I get involved with that? It's, a, it's you know, another one of these crazy things. Um, the first year I went to Israel, when I was there to, to learn Hebrew, uh, tragedy happened. My brother was killed in a car accident. And I spent that year in deep, deep mourning. I think one of the reasons I learned Hebrew the way I did was I thought it would give, give me a language of expression somehow to express what it was, I was going through. English wasn't enough, uh, at least the English I had in me at that point. And, um, and so I made friends and the Israeli uh, friends, and they all said, oh, you should read there's a great cycle of poems by a medieval Hebrew poet from Spain about his brother who died. And his son, they're sort of, you know, masterpieces of Hebrew literature. And, then, and they said, anyway, if you're interested in poetry and Hebrew poetry, that's the body of literature that you should study. That's really the greatest stuff. So that was my goal right away, was to read well enough so I could read this literature. And uh, I began sitting in on classes informally and trying to read it, and I did read it. And I even tried to translate a few things. And these same friends said, you know, those translations, you should hide them very <laughs> deeply in a drawer mm -hmm. and don't ever show them to anybody because they completely misunderstand everything. Um, and so I did sort of put that whole idea away of ever translating this stuff and being so presumptuous that I could do it after, you know, three months of study. Um, and it was only as one, one of these crazy things about writing. It was 10 years later, I think, I, had, I was back in the States, I was living in San Francisco, working in a magazine, and I had gone on vacation. Actually, with that same Hebrew poet I mentioned, the American whose work I first translated, we were staying at a friend's house in Portugal. And I couldn't get a, um, a plane back from Portugal, uh, so I had to go to Barcelona, take it, I didn't care. I you know, have a good book, get on the train, see the Iberian Peninsula. So I spent you know, a lot of time just wandering across that landscape, and it must have done something. Because when I got back to San Francisco, the next week I was watching a football game at a diner a Sunday morning, and I suddenly remembered, I don't know where, I didn't even know I knew them. 
I suddenly remembered, actually it was the poem I read you last night. That poem percolated up in me. It just like out of nowhere and I started to translate it and now my Hebrew was also much better by then and I just, and my English was much better, my poetry was much better and I suddenly saw, now I know how to do that. And it wasn't that it was easy, you know, but I understood now I'm inside this in a way I wasn't before, uh, inside this as a poet, inside this as a person. Um, and so I literally kind of ran home, <laughs> kind of a total cliched image of the, mm -hmm. you know, of the writer and the epiphany. But, and when I was, went to the Berkeley Library and had, I had a card there and just took out all these books and I began. So that was about 1989, 88, and became totally obsessed with it. And one thing led to another, and basically that's been 15, how long is that, 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And um, can you talk a little bit about how it in, informs your, your own poetry and your own, you know, how the past informs the present? And yeah. Um, well, it completely, that's something often when I also talk to young writers about, you know, one of the things is you just, when you're writing, your curiosity, it's something Ezra Pound said, um, Oh, two things I remember that he said that I encountered when I was young. One, he said the young have no idea how long the journey is. Or they have no idea of the length of the journey. This was Pound in Venice, very old man sitting there by the fireplace, <laughs> kind of <laughs> impressive looking. And you know, he was right. <laughs> um, it's, it's long, and that's a good thing that it's long. Um, and he also said that the most important thing for a writer is curiosity. And because the older you get, right, it's harder and harder to stay curious. That's just the way it is in life. Uh, you have to keep yourself fresh and new and things get, you know, encrusted. And um, so I was writing in a, in a certain vein. I think I began more as a kind of, more aligned with the avant-garde tradition in American poetry. Uh, although I read very Catholic, Catholicly and light, love all kinds of poetry. But this medieval poetry is much more formal. It's, people call it ornamental. And I realized I didn't understand what does that mean, ornamental. I, don't, I have no idea what that means. And I had to explore that whole notion of how ornament really is used in art. It's usually considered a pejorative, but no, here it's like at the heart of the art. Um, so I went into a big study of that. And it completely rewired my own poetry is the short answer. Uh, it gave me the courage, I think, to uh, try on all sorts of other approaches that and mix things and blend things and you know this again ethos of hybridization, notions of beauty that are just at the very core of this culture and are very foreign to uh, American aesthetics at this point I think uh, also came in uh, and its emphasis on music. Uh, I believe really deeply in a kind of uh, music and this is also in poetry and this is also a poetry in which um, Rob you asked about the past and the present. So the way that Hebrew poetry in the Middle Ages is built is Hebrew is not a spoken language. So what are you going to do? I mean, is that you're going to write in some stiff literary language? How do they do, how do they do it? They spoke Arabic. So what they did was they tried to imitate the Arabs. Well, the Arabs looked back to the language of the Quran as the beautiful language, and it is an incredibly beautiful language. So they said, well, we look back to the Bible as the sort of powerful language at the heart of our culture. And that will give us a vocabulary. And they basically, and they, get, they got rid of all the other parts of Hebrew vocabulary. They just wanted the pure biblical vocabulary. And then they grafted that onto an Arabic poetics, an Arabic way of writing poetry, Arabic meters and rhyme schemes and imagistic and tropes and all that, and genres. And so that every word in their poem, in their poems, are all from the Bible. So literally, from the past, they made the most vital poetry in the history of Hebrew, you could hardly argue, about their present. And that was a tremendous lesson for me, that this, this, the materials of the past may be our best or my best or the most appropriate material to address the situation of the present. Not in some stuffy academic way, not in a sense of illusion, right? So I have you know, all this knowledge about all these old things. But I didn't go to graduate school. I didn't learn this stuff because I had an exam. I learned it as a poet because I, this nourished me and seemed to me the most pressing thing I had to do. And so that became a kind of structural model that um, you know, the past could rise up um, to address the present. Maybe I'll read um, I have a poem of my own that's 
very much like that. It's not so much modeled on an Andalusian uh, form, but it is very much a case of the past rising up through the present. And you also asked earlier on about seeing, how the translation makes you see certain things. And um, so it's not just, you know, Shabtai sticking your face in unpleasant situations so you see them and have to deal with them. It's also, as a translator, my finding Shabtai and value. I choose to translate him, not this one over here who's more famous, who will be easier for me to get a book contract with. Right? Not the, you know, in, in Israeli prose now, you have the three tenors, they call them. Um, <laughs> David Grossman, Aleph Bet Joshua, um, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, who's I'm forgetting now? Amos Oz. All fine writers in their way, but frankly, I'm not interested. I have other writers I like, right? I'm gonna put my money and my time, time is money, behind these other people. So, um, so translation is very much a matter of getting, you know, determining what you see, and the Israeli reality in general is very much, is this kind of willful blindness that, that goes on. And um, <clears throat> also another NPR story uh, where we all get our, you know, our news, where I get my news in the States mostly. There was a really interesting story the other day about um, this Boston police, it was these two psychologists who were doing a study that was this beating of the, in the Boston Police right, Department. I heard that. Yeah, yeah, where, um, it was uh, somebody, you know, four African American suspects were fleeing the scene of a crime in which they had shot an officer, police officer. So, of course, all the police cars answer the call, they all go out, and um, the first person to, and one of the, they trap one of the suspects, he gets out of the car and he starts running, and the first cop to see this is an undercover uh, cop who's black. And he goes running after the guy, and then the other cops see a black guy running, and so they tackle him and they just, you know, Rodney King basically just beat the pulp out of him. And then there, were, there was a trial about all this, and it was, you know, it was brought to trial, and not a single police officer would admit to ever seeing anything. Not even that there was, they just said that we never, we didn't see anything, we didn't see it. And the psychologists wondered, well maybe they weren't, and one guy was convicted also, of, of lying and of participating in beating and he went to jail, a cop. And the psychologist, well, maybe they didn't see. Maybe something happens to you in certain situations where you don't see what's right on in front of your you're nose. Totally blind, yeah. Yeah, and so that's a very Middle Eastern situation too. And I have a poem about that kind of situation. <laughs> and it's very much about medieval uh, poetry and what I got from medieval poetry. And um, the story behind it is this. I was working on medieval poems and so because the medieval poems are made of the substratum of all this biblical stuff, it's very time consuming and even tedious at the beginning. And <clears throat> before you can actually translate anything, you have to kind of concentrate yourself and you go in your room and you read the poems, you decide what you're gonna translate, let's say the poem of the day, and then you have to look up all these biblical references. Because I'm not somebody who knows the Bible by heart and all that kind of stuff. I have to look up everything. Maybe look it up in three different translations. Look it up in Hebrew, and different English translations and really start to get to know it. And that's for sometimes every two or three words in the thing. It takes a long, long time. It also focuses your mind and gets you into the poem. So what happened was this particular morning, my wife and I were reading the paper, the same paper that publishes people like Shabtai, and they also have some disturbing stories sometimes on the front pages, and they don't hide them in the back pages um, about the Palestinian conflict. And this, but, and my wife is somebody who yells at the newspaper. That's her, uh, while I read the sports pages, she's you know, yelling at the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And um, so she was yelling at the paper. She said, now, this you have to read. You have to read this now and not wait till this afternoon. So I looked and there were just some incredibly, just horrible things that were going on in the West Bank. And you know, it's not that I'm a bleeding heart. I'm not. These are going on in the name of Judaism. I'm a very proud Jew, very involved with Jewish culture. It just, you know, it makes my blood boil. So anyway, it makes my blood boil, but I also have work to do. So I got to my, went to my uh, study across the, uh, the other side of the apartment, and I sit down and I start to work on this poem, and I open the Bible, and I start to you know, go through these things. And the first verse I read, I just I couldn't believe it. It seemed like it was a direct response to what I had just read in the newspaper. And I opened at random because I was just doing, looking for this poem. And then I read another verse, 
And it was also a direct response to what I was reading in the newspaper. And I just going out, this is, in, this is incredible. The past is you know, the perfect commentary. Everybody's so in love with the Bible in Israel. That's the text that makes the country. But nobody is making these connections. Nobody is seeing that one thing is directly related to the other. And so I, wrote, I wanted to write a poem about that. And so it is called Coexistence, uh, a lost and almost found poem. Right? You know what a, uh, a found poem is, right? Um, coexistence is something we like to think might take place one day uh, in the Middle East, which is, we're very far from it right now. So coexistence is a lost and almost found poem. And what I've done here is um, I've taken the facts from the newspaper without changing anything. I'm not embellishing any of the facts at all. I'm simply putting them in my own words, my own language, and giving them, I'm making them rhyme in English. And then I take the words that are in the Bible that I encountered in that little chance and, uh, uh, moment exactly as they were pretty much. I mean, it's an English translation. And I'm weaving the two together. And you'll hear the difference of the diction, so you'll know which is which. Coexistence, a lost and almost found poem. <clears throat> it starts from the epigraph from the book of Numbers. And the Levites, the, pri the priests, the Levites shall speak and say unto the men of Israel with a loud voice. So again, everything in this poem is true. Over the border, the barrier winds. The barrier here is that fence, you know, the barrier between separating Palestinians from Israelis, from Jews. Over the border, the barrier winds, devouring orchards of various kinds. Cursed be he that taketh away the landmark of his neighbor, and all the people shall say, Amen. The road was blocked in a battle of wills as the lame and sightless trudge through the hills. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to go astray in the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. The army has nearly written a poem. You'll now need a permit just to stay home. Cursed be he that perverteth the justice due to the stranger in scripture, and all the people shall say amen, taken away in the dead of night by the secret policeman who might be a Levite. Cursed be he that turneth to smite his neighbor in secret murder, and all the people shall say amen, as peace is sought through depredation, living together in separation. Cursed be he that confirmeth not the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. So, you know, those, literally, those are things that are happening every day. And people are not making the connection. In fact, the people who quote the Bible tend to be the people who are causing those things to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you touched on this a little bit last night, but um, I wanted to, before we open it up to questions, talk about um, Toni Morrison um, talks about uh, how she hates labels and hates being identified as a black writer or a woman writer. She just wants to be called a writer. And I just interviewed um, one of Aspen's favorite, Binyabongo Wainaina, who was a Kenyan writer. I interviewed him for Bomb uh, last month. And he um, he is similar, he like you know, wants to be a, be just called a writer, not a Kenyan writer, or an African writer. But he also, he wrote a piece for Granta called How to Write About Africa. And he's become I, sort I of a, yeah. a touchstone yeah. for, he's become what he calls that guy, right. the representative African writer. And do you, you know, ever, how do you struggle with labels of being called a Jewish writer or a Jewish American yeah. writer, or having to represent, you know, an entire country, region, Against whatever. representations, as you said that. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, like I said last night, I, you know, it's obvious that I don't represent Israel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's also obvious I don't represent Palestine. But I actually do present Palestine and Israel an awful lot, and particularly as an editor, and, but also as a translator and poet. Um, I, I guess I'm, I struggle. I have mixed feelings about it. Um, there's a part of me that wants to be known as a Jewish American writer, since that's where it all began in a certain sense, and that, that <coughs> matters to me. But I am against identity politics in literature as a sort of matter of principle. I think it's not good um, for writers. It's not good for writing. Um, I don't, you know, when we publish Palestinian poets, um, 
or when I translate Palestinian poets, the last thing I want, I mean, it happens. You know, it also happens with women writers. My wife is a writer. You know, they need a woman on the panel. They need a Palestinian on the panel. At this conference, maybe they need a Jewish writer or an Israeli writer. That's the way it is in, in all these you know, parts of the world. Um, and I accept that as a response, you know, there's a come, brings with it a certain responsibility and I'm not afraid of that or angry about that in any way. I sort of try to embrace it. Um, but as I embrace it, I do a kind of, you know, Houdini act trying to get right. out of that <laughs> while I'm uh, tied okay. up underwater uh, yeah. in that you know, box. But, you know, the Shakespeare, you know, to thine own self be true, but, you know, you want to sometimes break out of it. Right. Uh, well. But at the same time, those are the things that really matter to me. Yeah. That, you know, That's I've been formed as a writer in that part of the world and with those traditions, so it would be dishonest. You know, Mahmoud Darwish is, um, I'm just curious, People know, raise your hand if you know much about Darwish or, okay, so not so much. Mm -hmm. But he's the most famous, he died this year or last year, the most famous Palestinian writer in the world, probably the most famous Arab poet in the world, uh, and was the Palestinian national writer. And he was like the Bob Dylan of Palestinian literature. And he spent um, much of his literary life trying to escape, because mm -hmm. I'm not Bob Dylan, I'm not Mahmoud Darwish, it's mm -hmm. not such a burden for me. For those guys, it's this burden all the time. And so he spent a lot of time struggling, trying to write non-political poetry, just art for art's sake, that kind of thing for a while. But at the same time, there was something disingenuous about it, because it's that other stuff that made him Mahmoud Darwish, and without that, he was maybe not such an important poet. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's a very difficult thing to walk that line uh, regardless of how sort of conspicuous you or visible you are. Okay. So, um, any questions? Any? Uh... Yeah, and I can also read from this big pile of books I brought. Down. I, actually, I want to read a Tom Muhammad Ali poem just to be okay. But at one point, yeah. Tom. Okay. Uh, the way you were talking about translation, it seems like, for some writers at least, the translator almost finds the writer, not just the things you were talking about, I'm thinking like Austrian Wayne House for the Marquis de Sade, I'm thinking Bernard Herrmann for Genet, where they, it seems to be a real labor of love, but somebody's translating Stephen King into other languages, so where does it kind of, where does it kind of meet the commercial side? Right, yeah. <laughs> no, that's an important question, um, because if you are, if you're making a living as a commercial translator, you can't be so picky and fussy like I am. Um, I mean, I've been making a living as a translator, actually, but by doing classic things and through grants and things like that. Um, so, and many of the best trans translators, like of Latin American literature, right, the whole boom in American translations of Latin American literature, a lot of it came about because there were translators out there who had just had to make a living, and so they took the jobs, and then they found out that they liked translating, and then they kept on doing it, and some great works came out of that. Um, so there's a real divide between commercial translation, which is say like the New York publishing industry where novels are being translated or nonfiction um, and where you need, they're looking for a good translator, somebody who can just sort of do a good enough job. And um, particularly sometimes if the writer is very uh, famous, their books will sell anyway. It just have to be decent enough, you know? I mean, I know that's sacrilege, but that's, that is the way it is. Um, so I'm lucky, in poetry it's not like that, because anyway, not that many people want poetry to begin with. So uh, you have to, if you're gonna take all that time to translate, not to do your own stuff, and to you know, invest in somebody else's work, chances are it's gonna be a labor of love. Um, and same with the older, with the medieval stuff. Um, but Yoel Hoffman, who's another writer I translate, uh, a prose writer, who's published by New Directions in New York. So it is a New York house, but more of an, you know, do more experimental things. Um, that was a commissioned work, for example. I was asked to do that and um, found out that I actually adored it and did have a real affinity for him, and I've become his translator now. And you've done um, three books now, right? I've done three books and probably will continue doing him for you know, a while. Um, so sometimes that kind of reality of the marketplace can have you know, sort of uh, some really good things can come from it. And sometimes some, you know, run of the mill mediocre things can come from it. It's sort of the, the market doing its, its thing. Uh, I wonder if you'd amplify a little bit on your remark that beauty is absent from American poetry and maybe you meant all writing. Mm -hmm. um, but that 
either it is or people are striving for it more in Israel. Well, I, they're not striving for it more in Israel, that's for sure. <laughs> that's, my wife is now writing a, a book about beauty and ugliness in Israel. Israel you know, specializes in uh, the same chapter. I once wrote a, an essay I translated about some artists who were you know, waving the flag of ugliness. Uh, there's beautiful things in Israel and Jerusalem, but there are also a lot of ugly things, I think. Um, you know, so that's, I generalized a little too much there, but by and large, I've had this said about my work, my last book of poems, people, critics, I mean, in a positive sense, have written about my um, sort of lack of shame about being totally absorbed in beautiful things, uh, where I find beauty, that is, and without apology and, you know, it is a lesson I got from the Middle Ages. You, one of the an aha moment I had in translating medieval things was I looked at a beaker in the archaeological museum in Madrid, a crystal beaker. Now, crystal, grandmother's closet, crystal, <laughs> like the symbol of the bourgeois thing that you don't use that is totally like dead and, you know. And I saw this crystal and I saw the light coming through it. And there are a lot of poems in the Middle Ages about crystal beakers and wine and discrete. It was the gong went off. I said, ah, that's how beautiful my translations have to be, or I had to try to make them like that. So that kind of appreciation of beauty, whether it's in the natural world or in you know, uh, manufactured, things that are made by hand, um, I have absolutely no qualms about you know, um, putting my weight behind as a poet. And I think it's something that, you know, obviously there are poets who, James Merrill, and there are poets who are completely, who, who have done that and do that, but by and large, American poetry tends to be much more ironic or hip or confessional. Or, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I would say it's a minority position. Obviously, there are other poets who do it and who do it quite well. Did you have a follow-up there? Was that? But it's, no. it's not in vogue. It's to, not it's in vogue. To and and to, do, to be as, you run the risk of being called a reactionary or somebody who's just completely out of it. And you know, I'm a little out of it. I live far away, and, uh, <laughs> but it's fine. It doesn't matter, because all these things are cyclical anyway. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not a reactionary. I, have to, I, mean, I do come out of the avant-garde tradition and still write in some of those forms, but I think that all, everything's fair game for a poet. And particularly now that poetry is so much of, you know, not at the center of literary attention in the world, why not do whatever you like? If it gives you pleasure, much better chance it's going to give somebody else pleasure too. Yeah, I think you know Ginsburg was very much that way. He was, he was the most informed poet I ever have yeah. run across. I mean, he knew everything, yeah. every single. You, you would mention any single poet from Sappho on, and he could recite it from memory. And yeah, well, because and would get teary about it. Right. I mean, and because he, really, he believed in the deepest, purest sense of the incorporation of the tradition. Yeah. You know, just as um, you know, Blake took in Milton and then he took in Blake in that vision or whatever. That incorporation is to take into your, your body. And that's something, uh, you know, Gertrude Stein said something like that. She said, you know, a writer, a fiction writer, you must have all of English literature in me, in you. And I am very large, and I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a great, um, one book that I really proselytize about is Lewis Hyde's The Gift. I don't know if anybody has read that, but it's all about sort of the, Tradition and uh, it's just an amazing book. Uh, if you ever need to be inspired, uh, I highly recommend that. Uh, any more? I think we have a, time for a couple more. Yeah. So community with within the literary community, or are people sort of isolating, depending on nationality and religion? Uh -huh. um, so, so, like, you mean the Arabic, yeah. you know, Arabic and... Yeah. Um, well, there's a long history of... Um, basically, I've lived in Jerusalem, like I said, last night for 30 years. Now I divide my time, but um, I've been there more than I've been here, by far. Um, there's a long history of Hebrew writers and Arabic writers trying to reach out to each other. Um, it usually comes from the Hebrew side, or, well, no, I shouldn't say that. In the 50s, I think it, it was mutual. Um, it's not been successful, and in, in part it hasn't been successful because the power dynamics are so different. You know, Hebrew is the dominant language. Israeli Jews have all the advantages, culturally speaking, 
a minority, people who speak a minority language almost always learn the majority language. That's just the way it is in cultures. It's like water pressure. And um, if you want to work in a society, you have to learn the majority, language of majority. Otherwise, you're not going to have as much you know, opportunity for employment. So Palestinian Arabs, by and large, Palestinian um, Jews, uh, Palestinian Israelis, um, tend to speak Hebrew and then become familiar with Hebrew literature also. Um, whereas Israeli Jews almost never learn Arabic. In part, it's harder. Because um, why? You don't need to. So you have to really go out of your way to do it. And it takes a long time. And so they don't really know Arabic literature. And um, so I've had, for example, when I learned Arabic and started to translate Palestinian writers, I remember it was a kind of classic uh, case in point, a sort of kind of racism that you deal with all the time now. An Israeli uh, Jewish Hebrew poet said to me, he's in now 60 or something like that, he's a very smart guy. He said, Peter, maybe, and this was a kind of anti-politically correct gesture, which I appreciated. Um, he said, maybe the time has, you can read this stuff now. He says, maybe we just have to admit it's no good. Okay. Instead, of, instead of trying so hard to bend over backwards all the time and you know, publish this stuff in our magazines, because what you see, it's really not very good in translation and all that stuff. So I said, OK, you know, I appreciate, you're right. You should, you should be willing to say what's on your mind. He said, but are, are you also willing to find out for yourself whether it's any good and not just rely on these translations that you don't think are good? So call those translations mediocre. But if you're really curious, why don't you work a little harder? You speak French and Hebrew and a little Greek and this and that. So why don't you try to learn a little Arabic? Just see. Maybe, maybe it'll be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. Maybe you'll hate it. And you can say Arabic's an ugly language. I know. I tried. You know? But they almost never do that. Very few people do it. It, just, it. it really takes a lot of time. So there's that lurking. But I have to say that um, this poet uh, who I ended up translating, Taha Muhammad Ali, who is really, I think, one of the great poets alive today in any language, um, and has the greatest, I'm sorry, Rob, the greatest poet's face since the elderly Auden. Um, I met him through one of these dialogue groups. Uh, not directly, a, uh, a friend who was a coach, became a co-translator, um, heard about him through one of these dialogue groups where Palestinian and Jewish writers were meeting. And it's always strained, not in the sense of tension, it's always there's goodwill. It's just there's something unnatural about it. Again, because one side knows much more about the other than the other. And everybody's trying, but things don't usually come of it. And um, I myself got a little tired of these kind of, I used to go to them. Um, but he, this friend did hear about this guy. And he was curious. Curiosity goes back to it. He said, I'm going to look this guy up. And he went, he lives in Nazareth, this guy. And he looked him up, and he came back. He said, this guy's unbelievable. He says, A, his story is incredible. He is an autodidact who runs a trinket shop next to the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth. He's a Muslim, as he says, a Muslim who sells Christian trinkets to Jews, and you know, Jewish trinkets to Christians. And he never went, he had four years of schooling. He's, all his life, he's run this souvenir shop next to the church. He didn't publish his first book of poems, also for you students here. Uh, he didn't publish his first book of poems until he was in his 50s. Um, first published in magazines in his 40s. He also wanted to raise a family. He thought that was his moral obligation as a good man, was to not fritter away his time on this bohemian stuff. Uh, he was writing all along, but he was you know, running a shop. And, um, Nobody had really heard of this guy. They knew him more of as a, as a kind of character. And um, one or two Palestinian writers, Anton Chamas, for those of you who used to read the New York Review of Books, had discovered him. But again, he wasn't really known. His books were privately published uh, in Nazareth. And um, my friend worked out some translations through French, because he didn't read Arabic. <laughs> and if, uh, it weren't good translations. I thought, these, is, these are totally, this is like, you know, kind of orientalizing, and I thought, this is not interesting. And then I saw, but then I was speaking, or already reading Arabic, I saw one of his Arabic poems at a festival, and there was a very good Hebrew translation by a guy who is actually a genius, he translated from Arabic to Hebrew. 
And again, that was another gong went off. That's right. Oh, so I got this guy. Do you want to you wanna end with uh, one of so, his poems? Yeah. I think we have. Um, we're, I'm sorry, guys. We are running out of time. No. Can we can we end with one poem, and then? Sure, one poem would be lovely. And that's, we'll stop there. Okay. And you you can talk out there after. Yeah. Okay. So I'll read. Right. Um, it's a poem called Abdul Hadi fights a superpower. <clears throat> Abdul Hadi is a character in his poems who's like an Arab everyman. He's the same kind of person that no, we're talking about what's seen and not seen in translation and right. He's the kind of person who in the Arab world is not seen when politicians make their choices about what to do and where to send their armies and stuff like that, he doesn't come into, they don't take him into account. Abdul Hadi fights a superpower. In his life, he neither wrote nor read. In his life, he didn't cut down a single tree, didn't slit the throat of a single cow. In his life, he did not speak of the New York Times behind its back, didn't raise his voice to a soul, except in his saying, come in, please, by God, you can't refuse. Nevertheless, his case is hopeless, his situation desperate, his God-given rights are a grain of salt tossed into the sea. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, about his enemies, my client knows not a and I can assure you, were he to encounter the entire crew of the aircraft carrier Enterprise, he'd serve them eggs sunny side up and labana fresh from the bed. So we'll end there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.